The Minister of Finance and Personnel has also indicated that he wishes to make a statement. But before I begin, I would remind the House that, with the exception of the Chairperson of the Committee of Finance and Personnel, members are required to ask only one question. The time for question is limited to one hour, and we have over 40 members indicating that they wish to speak. I would attempt to facilitate as many members as possible, and anyone who does not come to their question quickly, I am afraid I will have to ask them to resume their seats in order that more members will have their opportunity. If that is clear, I call the Minister of Finance and Personnel. Minister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, I am pleased to be able to present to the Assembly the Executive's agreed draft budget for 2015-2016. Only a matter of uh, weeks ago, few people thought this Executive capable of agreeing a draft budget or that we could do so by the end of October. Yet today, I present the Executive's draft budget to the House. Failure to agree a budget would have been an abdication of our responsibilities. And whatever the truth, the public would have held us all accountable. With devolution, it is our duty in good and bad economic times alike to make sure that the budget reflects the priorities of those who sent us here. It means making the best of what we have been given. It has been said that leadership demands that we make tough choices. This, Mr Deputy Speaker, is a budget rooted in tough choices. We are all by now, I hope, well aware of the range of challenges we faced as we constructed this, our draft budget for 2015-2016. The tightening UK public spending environment, which began in 2010, continues apace. The pressures placed on services by the public do not abate. However, the resources available to fund those pressures have reduced dramatically. Between 2014-15 and 2015-16 alone, the Executive's resource dell has decreased by 1.6 per cent in real terms. Compared with 2010-11, when the Assembly last agreed a budget, the Executive's spending power has been reduced by around £1.5 billion. Looking ahead, Office for Budget Responsibility projections show that we can expect our resource tell to fall by a further 13 per cent in real terms by 2019. So, in this year and beyond, we will have a wide range of increasing demands placed upon our public services while we have fewer and fewer resources with which, which, with which to meet that growing demand. It is a situation, Mr Deputy Speaker, which demands that tough, sometimes even undesirable choices be made. Nelson Mandela once said, may your choices reflect your hopes, not your fears. As tough as the years ahead are undoubtedly going to be, it is our job to use the resources at our disposal in ways that fulfil the hopes of the people of Northern Ireland. Their hopes for themselves, their families and their community. Their hopes for a growing economy creating opportunities for all. And their hopes for first-rate public services. Mr Deputy Speaker, in spite of the challenges we face, our draft budget for 2015-16 is one built on hope, not fear. Founded on our shared desire to see a vibrant economy driven by private sector investment, to see our region and its people meet their potential, achieving a budget that embodies our hopes for the future, placing our emphasis on key public services that can shape the Northern Ireland we need and want. This draft budget is an important step towards these aspirations in spite of the huge challenges that we face. While much debate and discussion today and in the days ahead will be around how much individual departments will have to spend next year, our draft budget is not merely about distributing the money we have. It is about allocating those resources in a way that will assist us in delivering our priorities as an executive. The Assembly will be familiar with the fact that the executive made the economy its top priority. That focus and the investments that followed have borne fruit. During my statement on last year's October monitoring round, I informed the House that key indicators were showing positive trends and of my belief that the local economy was showing signs of improvement. This year, I can dispense with the cautious optimism. At long last, Mr Deputy Speaker, I am pleased to report that the Northern Ireland economy has well and truly overcome the considerable challenges of the last number of years and has entered into recovery. The evidence that we have exited the worst economic crisis in living memory and have turned the corner into better times is irrefutable. The Northern Ireland Composite Economic Index, published in October, shows an annual rise in the local economy of 1.2 per cent since quarter two of 2013. Interestingly, Mr Deputy Speaker, it is our private sector that is driving growth rather than the public sector. The services and production sectors drove the 1.2 per cent annual increase with 1.1 per cent and 1 per cent rises, respectively, while the public sector was down by 0.4 per cent. The positive direction in our economy is backed up by the estimates of growth made by independent forecasters like the Northern Ireland Centre for Economic Policy, 
and survey evidence from Ulster Bank's Purchasing Managers Index. Unemployment levels are now heading in the right direction, with the claimant count going down for 21 consecutive months. There were almost 10,000 fewer claimants in September 2014 compared to a year before. Unemployment now stands at 6.1%, a little above the UK average. While this is still higher than we'd like it to be, it is considerably lower than our neighbours in the Irish Republic, who have an unemployment rate of 11.5% and the EU, EU average, which is 10.2%. Latest figures show that the number of people in employment increased by 21,000 compared to the same time last year. Our employment rate, which stands at 68.3%, while still below the UK average, increased by 1.6 percentage points over the year. The House will know just how central the collapse in the local property market was to economic crisis in Northern Ireland. I am pleased to report that property prices are also recovering, with the latest Northern Ireland Residential Property Price Index recording an increase in residential property prices of 10% over the year to quarter 2 2014. There, was, there were also over 4,800 properties sold during quarter 2 2014, which represented a 25% increase compared to a year before. These are clear signs of a growing confidence in our economy. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the structural economic constraints that Northern Ireland faces are well known. Gross value added per capita, a measure of the whole economy and widely recognised as an indicator of relative living standards, stands at just above 75% of the UK average. In 2011 to 12, the most recent figures we have, total public sector revenue collected in Northern Ireland was estimated at £14.1 billion. The total public sector expenditure over the same period was estimated at £23.8 billion. That is a fiscal deficit of approximately £9.6 billion. Although our fiscal position is not as strong as we would like, public spending in Northern Ireland remains high compared to other parts of the UK, even if it has not risen at the rate that we would like. In 2012 to 13, each person in Northern Ireland had £10,876 spent on them by government, compared to only £8,529 in England. So at its starkest, Northern Ireland citizens get £2,347 more, pounds more in public spending per head than their counterparts in England. In key public services, we spend more per head of the population than the other devolved regions. Uh, HM Treasury's public expenditure statistical analysis for 2014 show how Northern Ireland spends significantly more per person on education and social protection than Scotland or Wales. Mr Deputy Speaker, I do not want to see Northern Ireland subsidised to the extent it is any more than the next person, but these numbers are a blunt reminder that our economy, and therefore our tax base, is not strong enough to stand on its own. We face fiscal realities that make our aim of rebalancing the economy an immense challenge. Yet, in a range of ways, we can see not just recovery in Northern Ireland, but importantly, how the policies pursued by this executive are helping to progressively transform our economy. Members will know how important it is to increase expenditure on research and development, drive up our level of exports, and develop new sectors of the economy where there is potential for growth if we are to change our economy and turn it into the vibrant, dynamic, outward-looking economy that we aspire to. On all these fronts, Mr Deputy Speaker, I can report success for Northern Ireland. The latest official GVA figures for 2012 show that GVA in Northern Ireland increased by 1.2 per cent from 2011. Total R&D expenditure in Northern Ireland in 2012 was £624.1 million. This represents a year-on-year -year increase of £57 million, driven primarily by the private sector. Our growing expenditure on research and development is marking Northern Ireland out globally as a small but very innovative nation. The Manufacturing and Sales Export Survey for 2012-13 showed that total manufacturing sales by Northern Ireland companies was up annually by 1.9 per cent, and the value of sales outside of Northern Ireland was also up by £415 million to £13.3 billion. This Mr. Deputy Speaker, represents the highest ever level of external manufacturing sales. Not only is the market for our manufacturing businesses growing, but importantly, three quarters of sales are outside of Northern Ireland, illustrating how our focus on exports is paying off. Our agri-food sector has been a real success story, defying the odds during the downturn. Total gross turnover in the food and drink processing sector was up by £285 million, or 6.7%, in 2013, to a total of £4.5 billion. Employment in the sector also rose by 2% over the same period to 20,390. Tourism is a sector which has huge potential for Northern Ireland. Investments by this executive in infrastructure like Titanic Belfast and the Giants Causeway Visitor Centre, along with attracting 
world-renowned events like the Giro d'Italia and the Irish Open are allowing us to capitalise on that potential. There were 4.2 million overnight trips to Northern Ireland between July 2013 and June 2014, with a total spend by visitors in the year to June 2014 of £755 million, representing a 6% annual increase. 2013 to 14 also represented a record year for Invest NI. Nearly 11,000 jobs were promoted across Northern Ireland, over £1 billion in new investment commitments were secured, and almost £250 million in research and development expenditure was encouraged. Mr Deputy Speaker, Invest NI has begun this financial year as they finished last. In excess of 7,000 jobs have been promoted in inve by Invest NI in the seven months since April. I am sure that the whole House will join with me in congratulating my colleague, the Enterprise Minister Arlene Foster, MLA, and Invest NI Chief Executive Alistair Hamilton for the work that they have put in to make Northern Ireland a prime destination for investment. The attraction of major investments this year by the likes of Concentrix, Moy Park, Baker Mackenzie, PwC, Ernst & Young and Deloitte emphasises how Northern Ireland is an increasingly popular place for firms to invest in, grow and create employment. A recent UK trade and investment report highlighted that FDI projects into Northern Ireland for 2013-14 increased by 32 per cent compared to the previous year, which represented the highest, highest growth of all the UK regions. This follows the 2014 Ernst & Young UK Attractiveness Survey, which showed that Northern Ireland secured 4.5 per cent of all FDI projects into the UK in 2013, considerably higher than our population share. On a per capita basis, Northern Ireland secured almost 40 per cent more new inward investment jobs than the next best region and three times as many as London. Belfast is now the number one destination globally for financial technology investment. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the mosaics that adorn the ceiling of the Senate chamber just down the corridor reflect the shipbuilding, linen and farming heritage that helped build our nation. We are justifi justifiably proud of our industrial past, but we have much to be proud of in the new Northern Ireland economy. The first region in Europe to achieve 100 per cent broadband coverage. The fact that one in three of London's famous red buses are built in Ballymena. One out of every three business class aircraft seats are made in Kilkeel. One in five computer hard drives contain a part made in London Derry, and 40% of the world's mobile crushing and screening equipment is made in County Tyrone. The times may have changed, the industries, industries may have changed too, but what remains constant is the ability of Northern Ireland to punch well above its weight in the world economy. Mr Deputy Speaker, our economy is beginning to rebalance. The policies this executive has pursued, the investments that we have made, and the endeavours of colleagues like the Enterprise Minister and the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. Together, all of the Executive's efforts have paid dividends. Our plan to rebuild and rebalance the Northern Ireland economy is working. There is, Deputy, Deputy Speaker, much work still to do. That is why we must maintain our concentration on growing a vibrant and dynamic economy, continue to devise and implement policies that aid industry, and, insofar as we can, invest as much of our limited resources as possible in areas that will yield economic benefit. This, Mr Deputy Speaker, is a draft budget that builds on our recent economic successes and points to a future of continued economic growth and prosperity. Mr Deputy Speaker, this House will be aware that the majority of the funding available to the Executive comes via the block grant from the Treasury. This comprises two elements, annually managed expenditure, which funds volatile spending programmes such as pensions and benefits, and the departmental expenditure limit, or DEL, which the executive may allocate to its specific priorities and programmes. It is, of course, the latter which is the focus of this draft budget. For 2015-16, the executive's total resource DEL allocation is £10.2 billion. Of this, some £550 million relates to ring-fenced resource DEL, which may be used solely to fund non-cash costs in respect of depreciation and impairment. This leaves £9.7 billion available to the executive to fund public services. For 2015-16, the executive's total capital DEL budget is £1.1 billion, up slightly on the 2014-15 level. However, this includes an increasing level of financial transactions capital, some £128 million, which may only be used for loans to or equity investment in private sector entities. One way in which the executive may increase its spending power is through the revenue raised by the regional rate. In Budget 2011-15, the executive, recognising that householders are still dealing with the impact of the downturn on their incomes, agreed that the levels of domestic and non-domestic regional rates would only be increased in line with inflation. 
Mr. Deputy Speaker, I am pleased to announce that this will continue to be the case for 2015 to 16. This will result in an estimated 2015 to 16 regional rate income of £649.8 million. Mr. Deputy Speaker, members will be aware of the calls by some to raise more revenue by stopping so called par super parity measures. In my view, those who argue that the answer to our budgetary problems is simply to introduce water charges or hike rates bills are wrong and misguided. This, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is a devolved assembly. It is up to those of us elected to serve in this House to decide what is in the best interests of the people of Northern Ireland. If devolution is to mean anything, then it isn't about slavishly following the policies of other parts of the United Kingdom. It is about tailoring policies to suit the circumstances of Northern Ireland, and that is what we have done. I am proud of the fact that Northern Ireland has the lowest household taxes in the whole of the United Kingdom. The average household bill in Northern Ireland in 2013-14 was £812, compared to £1,322 in Scotland, £1,433 in England and £1,613 in Wales. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I make no apology for keeping local taxes low. Yes, there are public spending uh, consequences, but it is the right thing to do. I believe in keeping as much money as possible in people's pockets. Yeah. Taking it from them might give us some short-term public spending satisfaction, but the impact on consumer confidence and economic recovery should not be dismissed. Keeping local taxes low is the right thing for the people of Northern Ireland. I can also confirm that the draft budget is predicated upon the continuation of a small business rates relief scheme, offering £20 million of support to thousands of Northern Ireland's small businesses. On the capital side, the Executive also has the ability to borrow up to £200 million per year under the Reinvestment and Reform Initiative to fund capital investment. I propose that we continue to draw down the maximum available RRI borrowing in 2015-16 to, in part, continue boosting the local economy and construction sector. Turning now to the detail of the draft budget outcome, in determining this position, there were a number of executive commitments which required consideration. I am pleased to announce that the Executive has agreed funding for several central issues. These include £5 million allocated to FMDFM to cover the cost of the historical institutional abuse inquiry, £10.7 million in resource Dell and £8 million in capital Dell for EU match funding, which will be held at the centre for allocation to departments as part of the final budget. The £15 million cost of providing a level of support for rates convergence has been factored into the regional rate calculation, and the retention in the DSD baseline of the funding uh, to cover the cost of the 10 per cent cut applied to the housing benefit rates rebate. In recognition of the importance of the executive delivering social change agenda, the social investment fund and the commitment to funding the child care strategy action plan, the draft budget outcome maintains funding at the 2014 to 15 level. 14 million pounds resource Dell and 15 million pounds capital Dell <coughs> is held at the centre for disbursement by executive decision at a later date. The executive is also facing a number of strategic pressures on our resource Dell. Members will recall that to help alleviate the significant pressures facing the Executive in 2014-15, the Chancellor agreed access to the National Reserve of up to £100 million. This must be repaid from the Executive's 2015-16 budget. I have approached the Treasury seeking the flexibility to reclassify funding raised from the sale of capital assets to resource in order to alleviate the additional pressure this would place on the Executive's resource Dell. A particular issue that all departments will have to address in 2015-16 is the financial impact of the ongoing public sector pension scheme revaluations. This work is likely to result in significant additional employer contributions, uh, contribution costs, particularly for the health and education sectors. My officials are currently engaging with uh, HM Treasury and the Government Actuarial Division to seek to ameliorate these costs. In the interim, the Executive has agreed to hold £133 million centrally uh, to help alleviate this pressure on departments. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Executive has agreed to set aside £70 million to fund a package of measures designed to mitigate the impact of welfare reform changes on the most vulnerable. In determining a draft budget outcome, an important consideration was the treatment of the Department of Justice. When policing and justice was devolved in 2010, Her Majesty's Government put in place a specific funding package. In order to manage this, the DOJ budget was ring-fenced. With the exception of funding for national security measures, which remain ring-fenced, that specific funding package has come to an end, and it is only appropriate that the ring-fence on the Department of Justice does likewise. This will fully integrate DOJ into the local budget process and allow effective management of the aggregate financial position. The starting point for our resource deal has been 
the 2014-15 opening monitoring position adjusted to remove time-bounded executive allocations and EU-related funding which is yet to be distributed. Having established a baseline, a level of reductions was then agreed which would provide funding for the central and strategic pressures along with an amount to be allocated in support of key services. In applying these reductions, those elements of the health budget relating to frontline health and social care pressures have been protected. This meant that the remaining elements of the health budget faced the same level of reductions as other departments. In line with the independent role that they exercise, savings targets have not been imposed on the Assembly Commission, Audit Office and Assembly Ombudsman. However, I have every expectation that these bodies will have due regard to the overall budget position in 2015-16 and that they would seek to manage their internal pressures from within their overall resource allocations and seek to achieve similar savings, returning any efficiencies to the executive for redistribution. Mr Deputy Speaker, in making allocations, I believe that it was crucially important that the executive give careful consideration to supporting its key priorities, as well as ensuring that legal or contractual and inescapable pressures in departments were met. With this strategic approach in mind, the following resource Dell allocations were made. In light of the significant and well-publicised pressures facing health, an additional £200 million allocation has been agreed, equating to a real terms increase of 1.7%. The Department of Education was allocated £145 million to provide it with an element of protection. DOJ has received £29.5 million of ring-fenced national security funding from Her Majesty's Treasury and an additional £45 million from the Executive in recognition of the pressures facing the PSNI. There is also a capital Dell allocation for national security funding amounting to £1.5 million. The Invest NI baseline within DETI, which was previously reduced due to the economic downturn, has been reinstated to the tune of £7.7 million. A further £30 million has been provided to DETI to ensure that our recent impressive record on job creation can continue. DRD has received £20 million for the reinstatement of the Budget 2011-15 decision on income to be generated from Belfast Port funding and £9.5 million for concessionary fares. Dell has been provided with a further £15 million to support the FE sector, in particular for provision for 16- to 18-year-olds. DARD receives £15 million in respect of TB compensation, cap disallowance and reform. DECAL has received £2.8 million in relation to a wide range of pressures facing that department. DFP has received £3 million towards non-domestic revaluation pressures. DOE has allocated £2 million to offset reductions to local government grants. And the P PPS has received £2 million for baseline budgetary pressures. And finally, OFMDFM receives £3 million funding for the Victims and Survivors Service. In addition to these specific allocations, £124.5 million of funding was then provided on a pro rata basis to those departments facing reductions to help alleviate the worst impacts. Mr Deputy Speaker, the result of these various allocations and reductions is an overall cut in resource Dell expenditure by departments of £213 million, with all departments aside from health and enterprise in a minus position. While this is considerably lower than the 15% that all departments, with the exception of health, were planning for just a few weeks ago, I fully appreciate that many departments will be placed under considerable pressure in delivering savings on this scale. We should not attempt to mask the fact that these reductions will alter the shape and nature of our public sector. If past performance is any indicator, it is likely that many ministers will seek to make the savings required by their departments by way of an identical percentage cut across their services. This, in my view, is the wrong approach in these circumstances. These are not pure efficiencies, the like of which we have become accustomed to in previous budgets, but rather savings, and this process may involve the cessation of some lower priority services within departments. In respect of capital, Mr Deputy Speaker, as it does not have the same uniform spending pattern that applies to resource spend, an incremental approach is not appropriate. Therefore, a zero-based approach has been taken by my department. This involved a, an assessment of contractual and executive commitments alongside a consideration of PFG targets and existing departmental priorities. As ministerial colleagues will have uh, no doubt have their own priorities, the capital position, while founded on specific projects and programmes, will be provided as a capital envelope within which ministers can allocate as they see fit. However, I think it is worth highlighting a few of the major projects that will be funded within the position. In health, these include the new regional children's hospital, the maternity new build and the critical care block at the Royal Victoria Hospital, phase B of the Ulster Hospital, 
Oma Local Hospital Phase 1 and Alta Galvin Phase 5. The A2 Green Island, A8 Belfast Alarn, A26 Glaryford and the A31 Macrofelt Bypass have all received funding along with the Belfast Rapid Transit Scheme. Significant funding has uh, also been provided to the Department of Education for various school schemes and DSD has received, also received allocations for both new build social housing and co-ownership. These projects show the Executive's ongoing commitment uh, of investing in infrastructure projects that will improve both public services and the Northern Ireland economy. Capital allocations also include £26.8 million to DE, Dell and DSD in respect of together building a united community. This is funded by additional RRI borrowing agreed under the Economic Pact. A total of uh, £115.6 million of financial transactions capital has been allocated to departments for projects involving loans to or equity investment in the private sector. A number of these projects require further refinement and this position will be revisited at the final budget stage. Investment in infrastructure is a key driver of economic growth. As members will be aware, we collectively invest directly in large-scale projects such as roads, public transport, hospitals, schools and water infrastructure, which are all areas within public sector ownership. However, there are a number of areas where significant infrastructure investment is usually taken forward by the private sector, but where we have a particular interest since investment helps to deliver on specific Northern Ireland executive objectives. These areas include social and affordable housing, energy production, energy efficiency and renewable energy, telecommunications and urban regeneration. I am keen to ensure that project promoters in all of these areas have easy access to affordable project finance. I am therefore proposing to establish a Northern Ireland investment fund to support investment in local infrastructure. This fund may utilise some of the financial transactions capital funding available to the Executive in 2015-16. It would also potentially allow large international investors, including the European Investment Bank, to invest in local projects that would usually be too small in scale to access this type of finance. As a first step, I have commissioned a study into the feasibility and extent of this fund, which I envisage will take four to five months to complete. This will inform the scope, scale, design and investment strategy of a potential fund. This will include determining realistic and deliverable investment need and demand, an appropriate investment strategy and delivery options to meet the Northern Ireland Executive's objectives. The feasibility study will also inform the ideal scale of the fund. Mr Deputy Speaker, I anticipate that the creation of this investment fund will in the first instance make a further £1 billion available for investment in infrastructure across Northern Ireland. The Executive has agreed that the unallocated £12.1 million FTC to be set aside to provide an initial balance to the fund. We can then further review the funding requirements once the feasibility study has concluded. Mr Deputy Speaker, the House will know of my ongoing focus on the need to reform our public sector. Never is a need to renew, redesign, rethink, restructure and reform our government being clearer than in the financial circumstances we now find ourselves in. What we face isn't one year of serious budget pressures. This is the new landscape for the remainder of this decade and perhaps even beyond. What Northern Ireland needs isn't just adjustments so that we can stay within our budget. Going forward, it is imperative that as we face further funding constraints, we continue to develop and enhance our already extensive and ambitious reform program aimed at delivering savings for the executive as well as improved public services. We have now engaged the OECD to undertake its first ever sub-national public governance review. The executive has agreed to the OECD benchmarking elements of our public sector against international best practice. This groundbreaking piece of work will assist the Northern Ireland Executive in identifying significant reform opportunities that will enhance public service delivery in the years ahead. Members will also be aware of some of the reform architecture that I have put in place. Initiatives like the Public Sector Innovation Laboratory and our Open Data Challenge have followed on from our existing successful reforms, such as our world-class shared services, digital transformation program, and asset management strategy. This draft budget builds on that good start. Making reform a reality can often require upfront investment that will garner long-term benefits. With that in mind, the Executive has agreed to allocate £30 million to a change fund. This fund is tailored specifically towards reform-orientated projects that are innovative, involve collaboration between departments and agencies, or focus on pre prevention. Departments have been asked to submit bids to my department, and those which are successful will be outlined in the final budget. While we would all prefer to be initiating reforms that are purely about improving public services. The starkness of our situation dictates that 
urgent action is needed to place our budget on a long-term sustainable foundation. To that end, officials in my department have, with the agreement of the executive, been developing a workforce restructuring plan. This will embrace all possible personnel interventions, including a recruitment freeze, suppressing vacancies, use of temporary staff, pay restraint, and a voluntary exit mechanism to reduce workforce numbers. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I will bring a paper to the executive within the next fortnight, which will detail plans for addressing these issues. Elements of this restructuring, such as any voluntary exit scheme, will require setting aside upfront funding. Funding of this scheme will be vital to ensure that we can deliver the restructuring our public sector requires to enable it to live within the ever more constrained resource dell position. I have begun negotiations with Her Majesty's Treasury to approve the use of £100 million of RRI borrowing to capitalise the cost of this workforce restructuring. This flexibility, alongside the reclassification of funding to cover the repayment of the reserve claim, will be vital in allowing the executive to manage the difficult public expenditure environment that lies ahead. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in his 1962 State of the Union address, President John F. Kennedy said, We sometimes chafe at the burden of our obligations, the complexity of our decisions, the agony of our choices. But there is no comfort or security for us in evasion, no solution in abdication, and no relief in irresponsibility. I do not underestimate the burden or the complexity or indeed the agony of the challenges we face next year and into the future. But in this draft budget, we begin to show that we are able to take the tough choices, not evading and not abdicating our responsibilities. In the sort of situation we face where the money we have at our disposal is falling, where the pressure on key public services like health rises year on year, and where costs like public sector pensions revaluation are considerable, it is impossible to construct a draft budget where everyone is a winner. Mr Deputy Speaker, I am sure every finance minister everywhere would always prefer to be announcing a budget where they were able to spread largesse around every department with no one losing out. That, unfortunately, is not the hand I have to play. But we must play that hand as it has been dealt, and that means difficult decisions and tough choices. Given the inevitable impact of budget adjustments on this scale, perhaps the easy option was to oppose this draft budget. That, Mr Deputy Speaker, would have been the irresponsible choice. Rejection of the draft budget last week would have plunged us into an immediate crisis. Not only would Northern Ireland have been without a budget for next year and all of the problems that that would entail, but we would have lost access to the £100 million loan facility that helped us with our in-year budgetary problems. Opposition or abstention might seem like an easy option, especially when you, when you know there are others who have the courage to do the heavy lifting you are not prepared to do. But those who fail to support this draft budget must explain not just why, but what their credible alternative is, and also, and also what they would have done when the £100 million loan disappeared. This draft budget has been constructed in the most challenging financial circumstances to face any administration in the history of Northern Ireland. However, despite the multitude of challenges the executive faces, we have agreed a draft budget that prioritises what is important to the people of Northern Ireland. Mr Deputy Speaker, when I began working on this draft budget, I was deeply concerned that the scale of the pressures facing the executive were so severe that the adjustments to public spending would be devastating. Cuts of 15 per cent were on the cards for the vast majority of departments. Instead, we have worked hard to stave off the worst, find imaginative ways to deal with our financial difficulties, and still make significant allocations to priority areas. We have produced a balanced budget with no overcommitment. We are building on the economic recovery by funding job creation, investing in infrastructure and creating a £1 billion investment fund. We have focused on reform and restructuring our public sector in readiness for the undoubted challenges that the years ahead will bring. And we have backed the public services that our people want to see prioritised with a significant increase for health and support for education and policing. This draft budget offers the best way through what, has always, what was always going to be a difficult year and starts to prepare us for the tough times ahead. It deals with our difficult circumstances in a way that is right for Northern Ireland's economy, for our public services, for our infrastructure, and most importantly, for our people. This is not a draft budget that is narrow or partisan or party political. It is about dealing competently and compassionately with the circumstances we are in. When faced with tough choices by backing health, education, jobs and investment in infrastructure, we have made the right choices and chosen the best interests of the people of Northern Ireland. The first duty of an administration is to set a budget. At a time of reducing public expenditure, this is no easy task for any government. 
In a five-party coalition, the level of difficulty is multiplied. It is an acid test for any administration, and last week, this executive passed that test. It is probably not a draft budget that any party alone would have set, but it is a product of negotiation and of compromise with decisions taken for the greater good. Last week, the executive faced up to tough choices and made difficult decisions. In short, we did what we were elected to do. The executive has agreed a draft budget. Now, through the consultation process, the public can have its say too. I hope that this draft budget will mark the turning of the corner for the executive, a new start after some difficult times. Facing up to reality, being prepared to compromise for the greater good, and protecting and prioritising what really matters to the people of Northern Ireland. Those are the principles that have informed this draft budget, and I commend it to the House. The, the sound system is picking up some distortion, so I would ask members to make sure that their mobile phones are not causing interference. I now call the chairperson of the Committee for Finance and Personnel, Dacky Mackay. Chairman, I get a last kind of corner. Can I thank the Minister for his speech? Uh, my concern, Minister, is the, the impact this budget will have on frontline services in terms of individual departments. Because obviously, in, in this financial year, health got some £80 million. It was protected. But still, we have a situation in Ballycastle and in Down where beds are being closed and indeed a hospital is being closed in, in North Antrim. And there has been no real attempt to deal with the fact that we all know exists in the Department of Health. And of course, I do welcome the fact that the Executive has agreed uh, to give an extra £200 million to health, and that money needs to go to the front line. But what I have to ask the Minister, given that his party tends to be uh, leaning towards privatising public services, cutting public sector jobs, as we have heard on the radio this morning, what guarantee uh, has he got from his own party's departments, such as the Department for Health, that money will be spent wisely and money will be spent on frontline services. Thank the, the chairman for, for his question. I think I thank him anyway for his question. Uh, in, in respect of, of the situation in health, um, whilst I, I, I do welcome, and I think somewhere within the, the, the member's comments, he did welcome the additional £200 million allocation to the Department of Health, which represents a 1.7% uh, real terms increase in funding for uh, health next year, well above the, the rate of inflation. Um, I think it is well documented, though, and, and the, the Health Minister, I'm sure, would, would um, concur with this, that there are uh, annually 6% in, uh, inflationary pressures on the Department of Health. Now, I don't think any executive or any administration anywhere, and we watch across the water as uh, NH the NHS in England grapples with the pressure, £8 billion pound pressure that it has to deal with before the end of the year. The same is true in Scotland, the same is true in the Republic of Ireland as well, where uh, health requires much more than any administration is able to give it. Um, that I'm sure the, the health minister may have may have required or may have liked more money to deal with the pressures that his budget is facing. But in the constrained financial circumstances that we are in, I think the £200 million, 1.7% uh, real terms increase, represents a good deal for health in very difficult and challenging circumstances. Uh, the member will well know, uh, and if he doesn't know, he can talk to his uh, party colleagues here in the executive about the extent of the difficulties that this executive, this assembly, faces not just in this upcoming financial year, but moving forward as well. And that does, nece that does necessitate those sort of tough choices Order. and difficult decisions that I talked about. And, and there are pressures, not just on health, but on every single department. Um, there is less money. There are £213 million being taken out of the resource budgets of the total, uh, of the part totality of departments. That will require reductions in service delivery. That is an unfortunate reality. Uh, what we are trying to do and move forward on, and, and this is something that has been agreed by the executive, certainly by his, uh, his party colleagues in the executive, is that naturally, therefore, when you have £213 million less next year and where you have more than that less in, in years to come, you don't need the number of public servants to deliver that. Uh, and there will be a need to reduce the headcount right across not just the civil service but the whole of the public sector. And I'm bringing forward proposals in respect of that, and I think there's a well-accepted acknowledgement on behalf of his party colleagues in the executive that we're going to have to do something in, in that regard. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that it is, I thought, the aim of every party in this House to rebalance our economy. Uh, and certainly what we are seeing, both with the growth of our private sector uh, and the uh, movement of the public sector to a, a lesser role within economic growth. Is that rebalancing happening? I think that's something that we should all be welcoming. I call Paul Gervin. 
thank the Minister for his statement to the House and the presentation of the draft budget. Uh, but could the Minister indicate what impact the policy of austerity pursued by the coalition government in London has had on the Northern Ireland public spending, and what do you anticipate it will be like in this, in the next, over the next few years? Thank the, the member for his question, Deputy Speaker. There are, there are some in this House who are probably better placed to talk about the, the uh, impact of reductions in, in spending, and particularly policy of, of austerity pursued in London, uh, has had on Northern Ireland, not just Northern Ireland, but other devolved regions and regions of, the, of England as well. Um, we entered into this, this budget, Deputy Speaker, with a, facing a 1.6 per cent real terms reduction in our spending power. And that meant a, a small reduction in our uh, block grant. So instead of holding firm or slightly going up and keeping pace with inflation, our, our block grant has gone down. So we started with a position where we had less money to spend. Uh, if you go back a little further, you go back to 2010 when the current government in London came into power, um, our public spending in Northern Ireland has not kept pace with inflation in the way that you would have expected. Uh, and in fact, our public spending uh, power has down by £1.5 billion. And that's a sizable amount of money that we are down. If you project that forward using the Office of Budget Responsibility figures to the end of this decade, it is anticipated that a further 13% in real terms, reduction will come off our, our public spending part. So that is a decade of austerity that we have the administration in London to thank for. Uh, they have made a difficult decision even more difficult because of the constrained economic times that we are facing. Um, and we have to, therefore, deal with, as I said, the hand that we have been dealt with. It is not the hand that we would want to be playing, uh, and therefore it necessitates those difficult decisions and tough choices that this, um, this budget epitomises. I call Dominic Bradley. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement. But uh, could I ask the Minister, uh, considering the fact that there is uh, quite a degree of public anxiety about the proposed pay freeze, could he indicate today how many public servants will be affected in this way? I, mean, I, thought, I thought Mr. Deputy Speaker was clear in, in the statement that work is ongoing in terms of an overall workforce restructuring plan, which uh, will, of course, look at uh, headcount reductions. It will look at uh, recruitment freezes, uh, and it will also look at uh, temporary staff and, and, uh, and look at pay restraint. Uh, let's bear in mind: in the last uh, fortnight, I've approved the pay remit for the current financial year, uh, which had a 1.5% increase. I just want to make that clear: a 1.5% increase for staff who were within their scales and a 1% non-consolidated um, non uh, increase for those at the top of their scales. Uh, now, the, the last bid by the public sector unions, unions was for a 1.9% uh, increase, I think coming in at 1.5% in the difficult position we find ourselves in this year, I think was a reasonable settlement in the circumstances. Uh, and let's just say we haven't, haven't actually, we aren't actually proposing uh, pay reductions, which the member was perhaps inferring, although that of course was a policy. Uh, that was pursued in the Irish Republic, of all places, where considerable reductions in the pay for public servants was made during the last number of years to get that, get that country through the difficult times that it faced. And I know the member is a, a great advocate of our, Irish unity and for uh, us mimicking and mirroring what is happening in the Irish Republic. Order. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm not hearing the member saying that we should follow the Irish in regard to that policy. I call Leslie Cree. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. And, and I also thank the, the Minister for his report. There's sort of a lot of detail in there, and a lot of it is not too pleasant. But uh, I will return to financial transactions capital, which will come as no surprise to the Minister, or indeed his predecessor. Uh, I see that we had 30, some 35 million uh, FTC, which in fact hasn't been accounted for and is likely to be surplus this year. Now, we can only keep, I understand, about 10 per cent of that. So over £30 million is going to go back to the Treasury. And this is money that's not part of our block grant. Uh, I see that in the Budget Minister... Remember, come to this question? Quickly. Yes. <laughs> Just trying to set the scene there, Doubt to speak. 115.6 uh, is in the Budget, but needs refinement. That's 11.7 of capital. When will we have a proper process which will utilise all this available resource for us so in fact that we won't have money going back? I know this is something near to your own heart. 
and particularly how it will work with the uh, Northern Ireland Investment Fund. Minister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The member has uh, frequently raised the issue of FTC in this House, and he and I have had conversations uh, in the Chamber before about FTC and concerns that he and I have both had about uh, the ability of the Executive to spend this, this new device. I think the fact that it is, is new has caused teething problems for, for departments. I think there is also a, uh, an issue in terms of the ambition of many departments. I'm, I'm disappointed, for example, that the Department for Regional Development, who I had discussions with uh, the Minister some time ago, about a year ago, about trying to take forward the Belfast Transport Hub using uh, financial transactions, because it's a perfect scheme, Deputy Speaker, for using FTC, because it is, whilst it has a, a public sector origin, it is developing uh, rail and a, a bus centre in the centre of Belfast. It has commercial opportunity, and therefore it has a revenue stream which allows the FTC to be, be repaid. Uh, unfortunately, it would appear uh, that TransLink have got their uh, claws into the project and are, would rather have, as I suspect a lot of other departments have had as well, would rather have conventional capital because it's easier to deal with. They understand it much better, and this is something new, and they're not prepared to to work with it. The reality, of course, of, of, of DRD not moving forward on the Belfast Transport Hub with FTC is that the likelihood of getting conventional capital, uh, capital for that project is diminished. Um, so this is an opportunity to bring that scheme forward, uh, and I intend in bilaterals that I will have with ministers about the budget to raise this issue with the DRD minister to see if we can actually use some FTC to advance that project. Uh, the member is right in terms of the current in-year position where we have, as, at this stage, 35 million approximately unallocated in FTC. He's right, we can roll forward about, about five, 5 million of that. Um, now, that still leaves a lot of money to be allocated. And this was, I suppose, the origins of um, the investment fund, which the, the member mentions and was mentioned in the speech. Uh, it became very clear to me some time ago that there was a need to find a vehicle, Deputy Speaker, in which we could put FTC into, and uh, somewhere which was off the public sector balance, uh, uh, balance sheet but still able to invest in significant infrastructure projects. This is the vehicle that I think, certainly in the next financial year and further beyond, that we, might, we will be able to deposit significant amount of cash into and in the process give cheap money for infrastructure projects and social housing or renewable energy. Um, so that is, a, that is certainly a possibility for next year. I think we can put large amounts in there. If we have advanced the feasibility study to a sufficient point in this financial year, it is possible that we may be able to use some of the unspent 35 million of FTC and deposit it with the European Investment Bank uh, for the investment fund in advance of it starting the work next year. I call Judith Cochran. Speaker. The Minister uh, repeatedly states that the draft budget prioritises the economy, but the figures show that there is still an emphasis on protecting areas where efficiencies could and should be made. And as a result, there are fewer resources um, for the Department of Employment and Learning, for instance, which reduces our ability to ensure a strong skills pipeline. Will the Minister therefore consider reallocating more resources to this area from perhaps the uh, Social Investment Fund, which to date has shown very poor delivery, yeah, yeah. and by doing so truly meet the objective of prioritising our economy? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the Member, Deputy Speaker, has only mentioned one area where uh, money could be moved from. At least, at least welcome the fact that the, the Member is offering one area, I mean, there will be lots of people, I'm sure, over the course of this debate will say, want more money here, want more, more money there, but don't actually offer any reason. I don't think the reason, though, that the member has offered is a particular good source for funding the total, um, the total amount allocated to the Social Investment Fund would do little or nothing to improve uh, the Dell figure and would actually only take away much needed investment from uh, uh, communities that are disadvantaged and very much in, in need of investment across. Northern Ireland. Uh, I mean, I see the member to, to, to the member's right uh, scoffing at the social investment fund. Perhaps he is scoffing at disadvantaged areas and the people who live within there and the help that they need. Um, I think it's, a, it's unfortunate. Order. It's unfortunate that of all of the areas that, that could be targeted, that this is the, tar the area that the, the, uh, the Alliance Party seem, seem to be targeting. Members mentioned the, the settlement for the Department of Employment and Learning, uh, and I think it is, it is fair to say. That in part because of the way in which the, the Minister for Employment and Learning constructed his bids and, and didn't have any legal or contractual or inescapable bids that were put forward, uh, it was difficult to prioritise allocations to his department and do so on, on any basis or any methodology. Um, we did work with the Minister. We met with, I met with the Minister on two occasions uh, during last week. As a result of those discussions, a further £15 million was allocated to the Department of Employment and Learning. Uh, that was primarily for ensuring that those 16 to 18 year olds who are uh, doing uh, work within our colleges got the uh, same protection as 
16 to 18 year olds in schools will be getting. And I also got a further 3 million for what the minister would describe as like na narrow STEM subjects, which is the sort of IT courses in universities and further education colleges that are the pipeline that Invest Northern Ireland then use for, for bringing jobs into Northern Ireland. Um, I think it is though important that um, whenever we have the consultation period, I will certainly listen and discuss, listen to ministers and discuss options with ministers. Uh, Dell, I would have to admit, is an area where I would be keen if there is money available during the consultation process that we direct it towards them in the final budget process. I think that is something that uh, most parties are, are agreed on within the executive. But it is one thing for me to have a sympathetic view about that. It is another thing to find that money during the draft uh, budget consultation period. And I would encourage members or ministers, whenever they come forward with the, the special pleading that they will all inevitably make, that they do actually offer ways in which we can find that money. And the member mentioned uh, priorities, uh, prioritises areas where efficiencies could and should be made uh, without elaborating on what that exactly means. And it's easy to throw these things around without actually proving where money can come from. So there's clearly a lot of work has to be done in developing that economic plan on behalf of the Alliance Party. I call Adrian McQuillan. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I also welcome this statement by the Finance Minister this morning? Minister, can I ask you what sort of schemes do you envisage that uh, will be supported through the £30 million change fund? Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank the member for his question. The change fund is a, a small amount of money in the grand scheme of the budget, of some £30 million, pounds, which I hope will be a, a, a catalyst for the reform that we quite clearly need in our public sector if we are not just to live within our, our means next year in a very constrained and challenging position, but also to prepare ourselves for at least another three, if not four or five years of uh, austerity coming from, from London. So th this, is a, this is a fund which is being held at the centre for distri distribution at final budget to departments who come forward with uh, innovative schemes which are um, primarily focused on um, collaborating between um, departments or departments uh, and their agencies, um, or also um, schemes which are focused on um, early intervention and prevention. Um, so in that respect, it is about allocating money to reform-oriented projects which can develop, in one sense, savings, yes, but also improve public services. There are no specific schemes in mind at this stage. It has been left very much to departments to work away over the draft budget period, so spending the next eight weeks working with counterparts in other departments to develop schemes which might avail of this funding, which will then be put into the baseline of departments at final budget. I call Maeve McLaughlin. And I thank the Minister for his statement uh, today. And can I welcome the, 200 million, the additional 200 million, uh, which represents the 1.7 increase in real terms to health? Um, however, given uh, uh, your own Minister's comments uh, in, in the monitoring rounds, the previous two monitoring rounds, on the management of the health budget, can I ask what additional oversight mechanisms, including the instruction that full equality impact assessments would be carried out uh, in terms of the protection of frontline services across the trust areas. After um, the end of the last financial year, um, whenever there was a, a small overspend within the Department of Health, before the allocation of uh, £80 million in this financial year was made to the Department of Health, uh, it was requested that before the first tranche of that, the first £20 million that was allocated in June monitoring, uh, the work be undertaken um, to ensure that the overspend did not happen uh, this year and indeed in future years. I am uh, very pleased with the work that has gone on. There have been significant improvements made in the management of budgets within health uh, to the extent where I am confident that there will be no overspend this year. Obviously, the Minister has had to make uh, some difficult decisions over the last number of days as to, to where those uh, savings in year will have to come from. Uh, and I know that there is much concern across the community about that. Um, in terms of the quality impact assessments, I think that is something that is probably better directed to the Minister of Health himself. Um, the draft budget is, al is also predicated on some work being done, both in terms of strategic long-term view at the Department of Health, but also to ensure that the money that is allocated, the £200 million that is allocated in the draft budget, goes to frontline services within the Department of Health. Uh, and the head of, this, head of the Civil Service has been charged with undertaking that work. Um, it may be something which I know that the uh, previous Health Minister was very keen that the OECD review that I mentioned in my statement focused in, in on his department, so that may be able to provide some of that uh, independent scrutiny of that department and where it's spending its money and how improvements could be made in the long term. I call Ian McRae. 
Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, can I welcome the, the Minister's um, lengthy statement this morning? Uh, the Minister referred to the Northern Ireland Investment Fund. Um, could he elaborate on, on that? What um, finances will be available to that, and what sort of projects could be funded? And if he has the opportunity, could he um, make a comment in, re in reference to the um, DOJ budget in respect of the Desert Creek? Yeah. I know the. Um, I'll take the second point that the members made first uh, in respect of Desert Creek. The, there is a, a, 50, a roughly £53 million pound line in here for the use of funding to develop the Northern Ireland Community Safety College at Desert Creek in the members' constituency. Um, that, was, that was put in, and the Mem Minister for Justice was well aware that that was put in. So I'm uh, a little disappointed, probably not disappointed in the same way that the member and his constituents will be, that if this project does not go forward, as indications are today that it won't go forward, a little disappointed that, that the project board met on the 29th, I think, of the month, and while before this budget was agreed, and yet no communication was made to, to me or indeed any other ministers that it was unlikely to proceed, and therefore we could have adjusted the budget accordingly. Um, but I'm sure my disappointment about the accounting treatment of that money is probably nothing compared to the, the people in Mid Ulster who will be, I'm sure, annoyed at the, the project not moving forward. In respect of an, an investment fund, I think this is something that is to be very much welcomed by all sides of the House in terms of something that will encourage and be a catalyst for significant private sector and investment in infrastructure across Northern Ireland. Um, again, whilst there are no specific projects that we have in mind, it is uh, from talking to the European Investment Bank, uh, Deputy Speaker, who we anticipate will act as our fund managers for this, um, if we deposit roughly uh, if we deposit about £100 million of FTC with this fund, um, it will help to leverage in, from, um, and taking the advice from the EIB, uh, from them alone, roughly a billion pounds of investment. So I think we've got a situation here where we have another, an additional, on top of the billion pounds that we invest annually ourselves as an administration, here is another billion pounds that can be invested in projects such as social and affordable housing, uh, like renewable energy, like energy efficiency, energy production, uh, potentially telecommunications and urban regeneration as well. And I think that's something that uh, a further a fill-up of uh, £1 billion for our infrastructure investment across Northern Ireland is something, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm sure everybody will welcome. I call Michaela Boyle. Gormorgut, uh, can I thank the Minister for his very detailed statement to the House. Um, Minister, in Britain, 80% of the budget cuts of the economic crisis have been borne by the most uh, vulnerable uh, in our society. What steps have been taken uh, to ensure that there is a more balanced approach uh, to delivering economic recovery here uh, in order that it will protect our most vulnerable in society here? Mr. Deputy Speaker, I, mean, I think the first thing that we should all welcome in this, uh, in this House is that the economy is quite clearly starting to recover. Now, I, I accept that it is not uh, uniform, expect, except that there are areas of our economy likes of retail, construction sector, which are still having difficulties. But the good news is that uh, across the board, uh, in our overall picture, the economy is starting to move in the right direction. We see that in terms of the growth in the economy in the last uh, year of over 1%. Uh, we see that in terms of unemployment falling for the claimant count falling for 21 consecutive months. Our, our unemployment rate down at 6.1%, uh, at almost half uh, the level of unemployment in the Irish Republic, for example. Um, and we see employment rising, we see economic act inactivity falling as well. Uh, so every indicator that had been moving in the wrong direction over the previous five years is now starting to move in the right direction. Uh, certainly independent economic forecasters, such as the uh, Northern Ireland Centre for Economic Policy, uh, project that there will be further growth in the economy this year and next year as well. Uh, and it's certainly backed up by survey evidence uh, through the like of the Ulster Bank's Purchasing Managers Index that it shows growth in the economy and confidence coming back into, uh, into our firms across the country. Um, I understand the point the member is making in terms of trying to ensure that recovery is something that it is felt by everybody. I think it is, it's incredibly challenging, and even in a small region like ours, to ensure that every area or every, every uh, person in Northern Ireland feels the same degree of, of recovery. Uh, that's why though, we've tried to concentrate the allocations that we have made. In a situation where we have less than £213 million less to spend than we did last year, um, 
that we've tried to make sure that that is where the people of Northern Ireland would wish us to put that money. I think if we were to walk out of Stormont and go and ask people uh, walking up the Newton Ards Road where they would want us to spend our money, they would be saying that they wanted us to prioritise health and that we wanted to try to ensure that there was some degree of, of protection for education and for policing. And they would also want to see us to continue to invest in, in job creation so that those unemployment numbers, which are falling, thankfully falling, continue to fall, and that people right across the province can get back into work uh, and start providing for their families. I call Pat Ramsey. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement. Could I ask the Minister, given the levels of apathy and anger that there is within the North West, and a feeling that the executive is not working for them, and the feeling and sensation, particularly in my own constituency, that they're second class citizenship. Could the Minister, and I previously asked him, in terms of the regional economic imbalance, what can he say to my constituents and those people living in the North West that this is a good budget for them, particularly in re relation to the, ext the extension to the McGee campus in the city? Yes, sir. Deputy Speaker, and I've said to the member in this House before that instead of talking down his city, he would be better serving the people of Londonderry if he was to come into this house, if he was to go onto the radio, onto the television, and start talking up what is a wonderful city, what is a wonderful region, what is a wonderful part of Northern Ireland. This, as this executive has invested significantly into the North West. Uh, the city of culture was something that I think everybody on all sides of this house welcomed uh, and appreciated the benefits that it brought to Londonderry. The development of the North West Science Park, recently opened by the Deputy First Minister, is something I think, again, using and leveraging in EU funding, is something that we can all be proud of. The developments through ILEX of the Ebrington site, of, uh, of um, Fort George, these are all things, Deputy Speaker, which I think we should all be proud of on, on all sides of this House and the investment that we have made into our, our second city. Uh, and I, what I can, you know, obviously it is a matter for individual ministers where they invest the money that is within their, their new baseline for the next financial year. But you know, I think this executive has a record of taking London Derry, taking the North West seriously, investing and putting our money where our mouth is, and investing in that part of Northern Ireland. And the people of that part of Northern Ireland are starting to see the benefits of that in terms of the, the spin-offs from the city of culture. And the member shakes his head, you know, and, and I think he does, I reiterate the point, he does the people of London Derry a disservice by talking his city down all the time in this house and on the media. There are investments that have taken place in London Derry, investments that have taken place in the northwest of Northern Ireland that consist constituencies all over Northern Ireland Order. would very, were very much welcome if they had it. And the First Minister has reminded me of the investment in the private sector in terms of jobs coming uh, to Fujitsu. I remember meeting the, the global president of uh, Fujitsu last year, talking very, very highly of the skills of the people of London Derry who are working for his company. He brought another investment into that area as a result of that. The investment in Seagate recently, a £35 million investment in research and development, creating 35 high-paid, high-skilled jobs in that city. So there is a record of investment into the North West on public services, on infrastructure, on jobs, and in culture that the member should welcome instead of criticising. And if there was that sort of investment in other parts of Northern Ireland, there would be a lot of, lot of, health, a lot of happy members in this Assembly. I call Mike Nesbitt. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. Could, uh, could the Minister update the House on the input in, into the negotiations towards this draft budget of, uh, of politicians who are not members of, of this Assembly? I'm thinking particularly of the reported input of the President of Sinn Féin. Well, I certainly had no meeting with the, the, the President of, of Sinn Féin. I think he may well have been busy last week with a few well-publicised issues. Um, you know, and I, I, think, I suggest that the member is also probably referring to, to some other uh, politicians outside of Northern Ireland, including perhaps the Chancellor of the Exchequer, certainly listening to his um, comments in the media at the tail end of last week. He reminded me, of course, that uh, George Osborne was his candidate for Chancellor in the 2010 general election. Uh, and I went, out and I, I went through my archives, extensive archives at home, and found this document, Deputy Speaker, and I'm sure certainly Mr Nesbitt will remember this document. It's called Invitation to Join the Government of the United Kingdom. Now, that's a, a joint manifesto by the Conservative Party and the Ulster Unionist Party. I don't think there was too many people took. I, 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 uh, I, so it's called an invitation to join the government of the United Kingdom. I don't think too many people took you up on your invitation. Um, and, and this, order, order. This, 
This document, Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is the blueprint, the, the bluest of Tory blueprints for reducing public expenditure in Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and the rest of the and the regions of the United Kingdom. This talks about this talks about this document, and the member, the, the member, the member doesn't want to hear this. If we don't want to be reminded, because uh, there's there's some fingerprints all over this document, and it is the members' fingerprints that are all over it. Uh, this talks about this is this this manifesto, which is of course. This manifesto, which is Mr Nesbitt's manifesto, talks about immediate action to cut £6 billion from departments' expenditure and further savings in future years. Um, and of course, if, if, the, if the people of, of Strangford had not seen sense and voted for Jim Shannon and returned him as their, their Member of Parliament in 2010, uh, these would have been the cuts that the Member would have been voting for in Westminster. And whenever the First Minister uh, warned people in Northern Ireland that that was what a vote for the Ulster Unionist Party in the 2010 election meant. He was told that he was guilty of irresponsible scaremongering. These, Mr Deputy Speaker, are cuts. And whenever we are facing reductions in our spending power of £1.5 billion, whenever we have hundreds of millions of pounds less this year to spend on public services to try to bring in jobs, to try to encourage growth in our economy, to try to deliver first-rate services across Northern Ireland. It is those cuts delivered by the Conservative-led administration in London, which the member would have been voting for, been tripping through the lobbies to vote for, uh, along with other policies like welfare reform. It is the member and his party, Mr Deputy Speaker, who are guilty more than anyone else for the problems that we find ourselves in in terms of public spending in Northern Ireland today. I call Michelle McElveen. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and, and I'd like to thank the Minister for his detailed remarks today. The education budget has been reduced by nearly 5 per cent, and I do appreciate that there, there has been some resource dial allocation, but could I ask the Minister what is his justification for lifting the protection which was previously afforded to the Department of Education? Well, there, there hadn't previously, uh, Deputy Speaker, I thank the member for, for a question, there hadn't previously been blanket uh, protection for the Department of Education in terms of the 2011 to 15 budget. What there had been was that there was protection afforded to that department in year in terms of the reductions, the 4.4 per cent reductions that were made in the June and October monitoring rounds. Um, and I, I've been consistent uh, following on from my, my predecessor as well, who made these points, that uh, the Department of Education should not be <laughs> afforded blanket protection, that there was scope for efficiencies within that system, just as there are within uh, any other department. Uh, and it was never a matter of, of me uh, locking horns with the, the minister. It wasn't a sort of a, a DUP versus Sinn Féin point. It was because whenever we started our work on the draft budget, uh, if we wanted to offer some degree of protection to health, which I think everybody universally in the House wanted to do, to offer considerable protection to health, if we had offered the same degree of protection to education, it would have meant that there would have been 22 per cent reductions to all other departments. And whenever we hear the concern, the pain, the anguish that is expressed about cuts in around 10 per cent, I think we would all agree that 20 per cent cuts would have been unmanageable and would have been intolerable for all departments. I still value, and my party values, the uh, issue of education. It is a bedrock of our society. It is the, the first staging post in terms of developing a, a, a vibrant and dynamic economy. Uh, but that being said, to protect it without suggest, to direct it in the first instance suggests that there are no efficiencies can be made in the system. And I believe, like other departments, that it should be making its contribution to the reductions that uh, we all have to face in this what is a very difficult, challenging uh, financial year. I call Michelle Mc sorry, I call Oliver McMillan. Can I thank the Minister for his statement? The Minister, it is quite clear from the report that the Executive have very clearly signalled support for the agri-food sector in signing off on the Rural Development Programme, plus the going for growth strategy. Will the, fi will the Finance Minister today in the House reaffirm his commitment to support for the agri-food sector in the context of this and future budget rounds? I, I, I can, insofar as I can offer continued support with a uh, constrained financial position. Uh, the Department of Agriculture, uh, the reduction that it is taking of 5.2 per cent, while still a reduction, while still requiring uh, the Minister to, to make savings within our department, is, is one of the better settlements uh, that departments are facing. And that is in part in recognition uh, of the importance that we all uh, place upon our agri-food industry. Uh, and during my statement, I mentioned the, the significant growth that there has been in the agri-food sector with uh, £4.5 billion pounds worth of, uh, of, of, a, of turnover in the last uh, financial year. I think that's something that, that we would all welcome. It is a sector which has bucked the trend very much over the last number of years and still has plenty of room for, for growth. 
Uh, and uh, that's why the executive ha obviously has both Minister O'Neill and Minister Foster have, have uh, come to the executive with their agreed paper in respect of the Growing for Growth document. Uh, and that is an area uh, that, you know, uh, resources permitting, uh, that I would be very keen, and I'm sure executive colleagues would be keen to support in the years ahead so that uh, we can maximise the potential that there is within that growing sector. I call Gregory Campbell. Mr. Speaker, uh, thank the Minister for his very comprehensive statement, and I, I knew it would be a comprehensive statement when it contained uh, a quote from Nelson Mandela and John F. Kennedy in, in the same uh, statement. Um, but can I ask uh, the Minister, in the very challenging environment that, that we are in, uh, we have had a number of uh, occasions when ministers have indicated they did not have sufficient time to implement uh, the reductions to their budget. Does he believe that the statement he uh, has delivered today, uh, if adopted by the Assembly, will provide such time? I thank the member for providing those quotes to me. Much appreciated. Um, the, um, look, I have, I've, again, uh, it is a, a typical complaint, I think, from uh, ministers who don't want to vote for or want to vote against for party political reasons, that they didn't have enough time to study the document. Um, I appreciate it was a fairly comprehensive uh, speech. The budget document itself was less uh, in size than the, uh, the speech that I have given. Members of the executive had 72 hours to read that document. If you can't read, study, and understand the implications of the document in 72 hours, then I don't know whether you should be in the executive or not. Um, but it, it would be, I might understand the difficulties that people had about comprehending the document if it was just a matter that they had 72 hours to consider all of this. Uh, officials from my department made a presentation to the executive um, about six weeks ago, maybe more, uh, about the likely implications of the 15-16 uh, for, for their departments. And that was a pretty stark uh, picture that was painted by DFP officials. At that time, all of the pressures which we hadn't hollowed out, which we hadn't tried to think about any imaginative solutions around, um, looked like we were going to have 15 per cent reductions for every department but health. Now, the member in the House will see that no department is now facing a reduction of 15 per cent. So every department is in a better position. And I accept that there are tough positions that departments are in. Some are still in double digits, but the majority are not, and some are in a, in a positive position. So the time that elapsed from that presentation six weeks ago to the executive last week, those six weeks that had passed, actually improved the position for ministers. Uh, and indeed, over the period of last week, the position for some of the ministers who abstained or voted against improved again. So Dell and DECAL and DOE got allocations between Monday of last week, when my first paper issued, and Thursday, whenever the executive agreed it. So one conclusion you could draw from that is that no matter how much money their departments had, no matter how much complaining they are making about the impact on their departments, they would never have voted for the paper, come what may. And I think there is a history and a pattern of behaviour in some parties within the executive who are happy to be in the executive, happy to take ministerial positions in the executive, but have never voted for a budget since 2007. Uh, in terms of departments grappling with these, and there are, they are, look, I accept, they are significant savings that many departments will have to make. They will have an impact on, on public services. We have tried, in, so far as we can, to limit the impact on key frontline services, but there will be an impact on our, on our public services and, therefore, the shape and nature of our public sector. That's why, Deputy Speaker, uh, it wasn't whilst the £100 million loan facility focused our mind last week, we needed to get a draft budget out so that departments, knowing full well that we would have significant savings to make in the next financial year, had as much time as they possibly could to try to implement those savings so that they wouldn't hit frontline services, that they could try to make those savings in other non-frontline areas of their department's business. Uh, so I think that while she would always have liked a bit more time, I think the departments do have sufficient time, uh, particularly over the next eight weeks in the consultation period, to try to make sure that the worst impact of these cuts aren't felt by, by citizens in terms of diminishing services. I call Paul Given. Speaker, uh, in terms of how other parties responded to the uh, draft budget, uh, the Alliance Party indicated that they were abstaining uh, because water charges haven't been introduced and rates haven't uh, increased. What's the Minister's views on raising rates and introducing water charges to Northern Ireland? Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, well, what Sir Humphrey said was probably the, the most courageous of um, reasons for being put forward for not voting for the draft, draft budget. Um, you're going to take a very, a very straightforward view in respect of raising revenue through water charges or, or hiking our rates. Um, and as I don't think it is the, the right way to go about solving our short-term financial problems. Because you know, whenever, I, whenever I listen to 
it could be the Alliance Party, it could be the Green Party. You know, maybe this is a, a topic which comes up at Green Party or Alliance Party wine and cheese evenings, and the people are, are quite content to, to pay water charges or uh, pay significant uh, increases in their in their rates bills. Maybe that's maybe that's it's a, the equivalent of the sort of Lib Dems one p one p on on income tax. Um, Maybe it's, maybe it's their equivalent of that one pay on, on, on income tax, but whatever, whatever the motivation for it, whenever you hear various spokespeople talk about, let's introduce water charges, that will solve our problem. Let's significantly increase our rates bill. And let's bear in mind, for every 1% 1, 1 we increase our regional rate, we raise about £5 million. So to solve this problem, we would have to rate, increase it by a considerable number of percentage points to get any sort of money that we could do anything with. But whenever you, I hear them talk about this, I sort of think that they think that this money isn't paid by real people. The people who would pay the water charges are on average probably about £500 a year or who would pay an increase in their rates bills are real people living and working in Northern Ireland today. And those are people, and I accept that whilst we have economic recovery starting to happen in Northern Ireland, and we welcome that fact, that the last place in which people are feeling confidence, in which they're feeling recovery, is in their own household incomes. So that's another 500, maybe six, 700 pounds with rates as well that they would have to find in their household income. I would suggest that the impact on confidence in those households would be much more than five, six or seven hundred pounds and you will see spending on other items go down by much more than that. You will sap the confidence that is starting to come back into our economy, Mr Deputy Speaker, and you will impact ne negatively on economic recovery. So just bear in mind whenever people come forward with the suggestions for water charges, so when the Alliance or the Green Party say let's introduce water charges, or whenever they say let's increase rates bills, that real people in Northern Ireland have to pay those rates bills, have to pay those water charges, and there will be an impact on the economy as a result. I call Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I'm normally a very courteous person, but I can't thank uh, the Minister for the introduction of this savage budget. Uh, and could I remind the Minister that by introducing this budget, uh, and I refer to the remarks of Mr. Nesbitt, by introducing this budget, uh, he has reduced himself to being a message boy for George Osborne. We have a question. And, and could I say further to that? Uh, that there is intense outrage out there in relation to this, particularly amongst the trade unions. And I would ask the Minister, is it sufficient, is it sufficient, is it sufficient for the Minister to allow a period of eight weeks for consultation instead of 12 weeks, which would allow people to sufficiently answer the savagery of this budget? budget? Mr. Deputy Speaker, if the member is wanting to offer thanks to anybody in the House for uh, the reductions in public expenditure in Northern Ireland that flow from this budget, I thought I made it pretty clear that all thanks should be directed towards Mike Nesbitt and the Ulster Unionist Party. Um, in, in, in respect of um, consultation, um, it is an eight week period of, of consultation. You know, not every part of the United Kingdom, particularly you know, if you go to Westminster and, and our members of Parliament, uh, will be able to testify. The Chancellor introduces his budget in one day, the next day the finance bill comes before them and by the, next, the end of the next week it's a, it's a law. Uh, so actually we're in a not bad position in terms of consultation in Northern Ireland by the fact that we go out for it at all. Uh, eight weeks is less than the 12 weeks which is seen to be the sort of the, the normal degree of consultation. The, the reality of, of, of the delay in getting to agree a draft budget, and I welcome the fact that even with delay that we have got a draft budget and we've removed the uncertainty, not just around this institution, but about uh, ensuring that a budget was in place, um, that the delay that there was meant that we couldn't afford a 12-week consultation period. Uh, Mr Wilson, who is the Finance Minister, introduced the 2011 budget, didn't get the draft budget in until I think it was 15th of December uh, in that year and had an eight-week consultation period which actually ran over, over Christmas. So even though this has been characterised as a, a, a draft budget which has been delayed, it is still in place much earlier than the 11 to 15 budget and it will conclude before the end of the new year rather than going over into the new year. If we had have, uh, went for a 12-week consultation which would have taken us to the end of January, we would have had the real prospect of having no budget in place and no finance or no budget act in place for the start of the next financial year because we have obviously some work to do between the end of the consultation and agreeing the final budget um, and then we have to go through a legislative process in this House. If we had to wait to the end of January to then do any sort of negotiations around uh, further allocations or reductions if required, 
then we wouldn't have had the time to implement the legislation and we would have had a real uh, possibility that there would have been no budget in place for the start of the financial year. And whilst the member might, might warmly uh, welcome consultations or want to have consultations for 12 weeks, I'm sure in the circumstances he'll understand that it is something, that simply something we can't afford. I call Alistair Ross. Mr Deputy Speaker, and unlike the SDLP, I'm glad that the Minister has faced up to the difficult economic realities that we face and been able to present a, a balanced budget to the House uh, today. Um, I also think it's right that we have continued to support um, the facilitation of job creation. I think that's good news for people in Northern Ireland. But can I ask him what support there will be for small businesses, particularly um, through the rating system? Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm, I'm very glad that... Um Predecessors in my post have been able to introduce a, a range of, of measures to support small businesses through the worst of the, the economic downturn. Uh, and the member in the House will be aware that the Small Business Rates Relief really Scheme, which has been, I think, a, a great success to, in all parts of Northern Ireland, uh, helping small businesses. In fact, half of small businesses are getting uh, at least 20% off their, their rates bills as we, we currently stand. Um, that, um, that that support is able to continue because of a, an allocation of, of 20 million that has been made in this budget to a continuation of the Small Business Rates Relief Scheme. Now, the scheme, Deputy Speaker, is undergoing um, a review at this minute in time. I'd be due to make a, a final decision on the shape uh, and nature of the scheme uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but I'm very, very glad that whatever the perhaps change, shape or nature that there may be in the scheme, that £20 million has been agreed to be set aside by the executive to ensure that our small businesses, particularly those in retail, which still suffer in, in, in many parts of Northern Ireland, and that support will still be there and we'll be able to uh, back our small businesses through a small business rates relief scheme. I call Trevor Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm sure, uh, in terms of the response the Minister gave earlier to Mike Nesbitt, I'm sure he's also surprised in terms of the response from the Regional Development Minister in terms of the budget, where he described the budget as savage, even though he himself was advocating for the Tories in the last election. But can I welcome the fact that the Minister has not only minimised the reductions to 4 per cent... Can we have a question? Yes, can I welcome the fact that the Minister has minimised it to 4 per cent and also added £10 million to concessionary so, fares? Sorry, could can the we minister, have a question? Could the Minister tell us if the DRD Minister has agreed to ac uh, access the Translinx reserves of £55 million to actually lessen the pressures on his department? Well, yeah, I, I was shocked as well as a, knowing the figures, um, which we couldn't obviously publicly reveal, although some, somebody in the executive uh, did see fit to take an early draft of the paper and pass it on to, to parts of the press. Um, that even those early figures that were leaked to the press showed that the Department for Regional Development in terms of its reduction, because we allocated uh, £20 million, which hadn't been there in its baseline because of the um, inability of the Minister or unwillingness of the Minister to access £20 million from the, the Port of Belfast. Um, it had also been allocated £9.5 million to cover concessionary fares, uh, so that that issue, instead of becoming a political football, as it traditionally has become, where the Minister said that they usually pointed the figure at me or uh, my predecessor and said that we were going to take that money away from that scheme. That is now there for the Department for Regional Development to ensure that the concessionary fares scheme for over 60s is there. So that's 29.5 million allocation plus another pro, pro rata share of the 124.5 million pounds meant that instead of being in the sort of position that my department is in, for example, where we have to find 11 per cent reductions for next year, the Department for Regional Development is facing reductions of 4 per cent. Now, Member, Minister for Regional Development might want to characterise a 4 per cent reduction, which I think in the circumstances, where I accept it is a reduction, it will lead to difficult decisions that have to be made by the Minister. It is nowhere near as savage as many other departments, indeed the majority of departments in the executive are facing in future years. Um, I think the, the reason for the member characterising that as savage was to set himself up for the vote that he made on, on Thursday and he had no intention of actually voting for the budget and wanted to try to characterise it as a deeply difficult budget for, for his department whenever that was not the case. In, in terms of Translink Reserves, the minister wrote to me last week um, indicating much like his inability or unwillingness to seek money from the Port of Belfast, that if we were to pursue, or if he was to pursue, Translink sizable reserves that the member talks about, that that would almost empty it of any money and any reserves at all. Now, my understanding was that the figure was in around 50 odd million that the member has talked about. Um, the minister has pointed out that it has a 12 million pound loss this year, anticipates similar next year. That still leaves a considerable amount of money in the reserves of Translink, which the, the minister could pursue if he wanted to pursue but I fear on past, past behaviour and his previous record that the Minister doesn't have the political courage 
to pursue those reserves any more than he had to pursue the Port of Belfast for the £20 million it did have. I call Robin Newton. Thank the Minister for his uh, very detailed uh, statement. <coughs> and, uh, I have to say, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think Northern Ireland today is in a better place than it was uh, 10, 12 days ago. I thank him for all the work that he has done there. On page 8, he has uh, outlined the £100 million pounds that uh, has been granted as a loan facility for this year. I wonder, could the Minister just detail how that might be repaid uh, next year? Mr. Deputy Speaker, the, the £100 million pound loan which the First Minister and I secured from the Chancellor a few weeks ago was derided by many in this House. Um, uh, and it was referred to as a payday loan. It was the only payday loan that I've ever seen where there was no interest yeah. involved in. But it clearly um, produced a pressure on our budget for next year, which, if it had come out of that £100 million, had have come out of a resource budget, that would have been a, uh, probably another 1% and reductions, maybe, maybe close to 2 per cent for some departments in terms of their, their budget. So, in fact, we were able to take cuts down from 15 per cent to closer to 10 for the worst off departments that would have gone back up again if we had to repay that amount of money. Um, through um, some imaginative thinking around our capital receipts, uh, and there are 108 million of capital receipts which have already been identified by departments in the Northern Ireland Executive. So this is the sale of surplus land, surplus uh, properties, uh, and also repayment of, of loans, including financial transactions, capital loans, which come back into the Executive. There is £108 million, which almost, Deputy Speaker, we have banked already. Uh, and we are seeking permission, and we anticipate that we will get permission from the Treasury to switch that from capital to resource so that there is no additional pressure uh, on our resource budget, budget, which is under the most pressure in the next financial year. Those who might be concerned that that takes money away from capital, we have increased the target because we have, as I say, banked that £108 million to repay the £100 million. It doesn't mean that there aren't other assets that could be sold to bring in revenue. So we have increased the target to uh, £150 million, um, which will mean that there will be a replenishment of at least half of that capital receipt, which will go into our capital budget, which of course rises, um, rises uh, next year, never mind the £1 billion investment fund that we will have hopefully up and running next year as well. I call John Dallet. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the, the Minister, in a unique moment of inspiration on page 3, tells us that our economy can never be strong enough to stand on its own. Is this a stark reminder that we need to start out our political differences north and south so that we can develop an all-island economy which benefits both parts of the island? <laughs> <laughs> I have been, I have been, uh, Mr. Dep Order. Deputy Speaker, I've been used to being misquoted over the last week, but um, I won't let the member misquote my, my statement. I didn't say that we will never be able to pay our own way. I said that we are not in a position to be able to pay our own way. We are not, and that's a, that's a, a fiscal reality. It's a fiscal reality which makes rebalancing our economy incredibly challenging uh, in Northern Ireland. It's one of the reasons that we are continuing to pursue the devolution of, of corporation tax powers as, uh, as a tool that will allow us to further rebalance our economy beyond which, uh, the rebalancing which has already taken place over, over the last number uh, of years. Uh, and I, I wouldn't necessarily I, say I, I welcome the fact that our nearest neighbour's economy is doing much better than it has in recent times, uh, and that is clearly to the benefit of the people of Northern Ireland, particularly in business in Northern Ireland, in terms of trading into that important near market. I wouldn't necessarily agree with his characterisation that it is standing on its own feet, because it is considerably being bolstered by the Troika, by the IMF, by uh, the European yeah. Union, uh, and of course, yes, as, as, as colleagues have reminded me, a £7 billion non-repayable loan from uh, the, the, uh, Her Majesty's Treasury. So I wouldn't necessarily agree with the Carrie West. I welcome the fact that it's doing much better. I wouldn't necessarily agree that it is standing on its own two feet as well. I call William Humphrey. And I thank the Minister for Stephen to House today and appreciate the work that he has done on behalf of the people of Northern Ireland. Can I say that it's sad that we have parties in this House that are financially and fiscally illiterate, uh, as, as continually being exemplified the by the SDLP? The question, what, what does the uh, Minister believe the Executive can do to reduce the number of people working in the public sector if he believes it's overloaded? But I don't think. You know, I don't think pursuing reductions in our – whilst we have all uh, subscribed, I, I, I thought, in this House, I know that our party certainly has to rebalancing our economy, and that's why we've been 
pursuing corporation tax, while it won't in itself transform our economy and rebalance from the public to the private sector, it is the single best tool that would be available to us to, to assist us along that road. Uh, and we all, I think, have agreed that of the need to rebalance our economy. Uh, and whilst we are agreed to that, I don't think that any finance minister or any administration would want to, um, without um, the need, want to reduce the size of our, our public sector. But we are in a position where we have less money to spend. We have cuts of £213 million being applied to departments this year. If you look at the proje projections that um, the Office of Budget Responsibility are talking about, you're looking at 13 per cent real terms reductions. If you kind of con contextualise that, we have a 1.6 per cent real terms reduction, uh, reduction this year. So we're looking at you know, almost seven times uh, more uh, in terms of reductions over the next three financial years. And you cannot look at a situation like that and be sensible and be planning for the long term if you think you can keep your public sector at the size that it currently is. It stands to reason, Deputy Speaker, if you have less money, you're spending less money on public services, that you therefore need less people to deliver those public services. And I think it is an opportune moment to bring forward a voluntary exit scheme, which is what my department is looking at over the next number of weeks, to allow those who want to go, no one will be forced, those who want to go to leave and to leave so with a, a package that will assist them um, in, the, in the short and medium term. Um, I think that if we were to follow the trend in the whole of the UK. We have had about 4 per cent reductions in our, the size of our public sector, which is still large at 212,000 people, which still accounts for about 35 per cent of our total workforce, far higher than anywhere else in the United Kingdom. If we were to have the same degree of reductions, um, it wouldn't be 4 per cent as the rest of the UK, it would be an average of 10 per cent. So if we were to follow that trend, uh, we could save hundreds of millions of pounds uh, that would be saved on a recurrent basis. That would not only allow us um, to get ourselves out of the resource expenditure problems that we are facing next year and in future years, but would also help us to fund a reduction in corporation tax, which does have the capacity to transform our economy and rebalance our economy between the public and private sectors. I call Stephen Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister as well. And can I ask him further to outline what this draft budget means in respect of welfare reform? Mr. Deputy Speaker, there is an allocation made in this draft budget of, of some £70 million pounds for uh, a package of, of welfare reform measures. And these are the sorts of measures that um, the previous uh, Social Development Minister, Nelson McCausland, negotiated successfully, uh, unlike any other part of the United Kingdom, negotiated successfully with the Department for Work and Pensions. So this was a, a package of measures around ensuring that the bedroom tax wouldn't uh, hit new customers in or existing customers in Northern Ireland, um, a whole series of flexibilities around payments and frequency of payments and to um, uh, direct payments to, to social landlords. Um, so all of those uh, measures that we have negotiated, and there, is, there was a contingency fund uh, of about £30 million within that uh, package of £70 million, pounds, which I believe and the party believes can be used to, uh, if members want or if, if members of the executive, members of the assembly want to specifically target areas where there will be uh, considerable impact of welfare reform, as we learn from the lessons of the rollout of welfare reform in Great Britain. So that £70 million has been set aside in this draft budget for that. I, I hope now, Deputy Speaker, now that the, the budget has been taken off the agenda in the talks in terms of having a draft budget agreed, uh, that that frees up time and it frees up space within the talks process where the issue of welfare reform is, uh, I think should be, uh, and parties can sensibly and maturely discuss particularly the suggestions that my own party has submitted to the, that talks process and try to find a way through welfare reform that ensures that we can implement it and we can keep welfare payments happening in Northern Ireland, but we don't have the worst effects of welfare reform as they have happened across the water. This budget does not account for any future penalty, so the £114 million of penalty for next year is not in this budget, and nor is any cover for the development of an IT system for Northern Ireland. The cost of doing both of those things, Deputy Speaker, would have been around £200 million. And I think it is clear now to everyone when they look at this draft budget, if we had to find a further £200 million of reductions, that would have equated to 4 or 5 or even 6 per cent reductions for departments above and beyond the cuts that they are facing next year. That is literally a price that this executive of this country couldn't afford. And I think the way that we have found through the issue of welfare reform, trying to bring it to a head, trying to focus on a package of measures that will mitigate the worst effect of welfare reform is the right way to proceed on that issue. I call Sydney Anderson. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the, the Minister for his detailed statement to the House today? Minister, corporation tax powers has been much talked about both inside this chamber and outside the chamber. Uh, can I ask you, Minister, have you taken into account in the draft budget the possible devolution of corporation tax powers to the Northern Ireland Assembly? 
Mr. Deputy Speaker, the, the draft budget itself does not take into account uh, the devolution of, of corporation tax powers. We are still uh, obviously hopeful um, of a positive decision by the Prime Minister announced no later uh, than the autumn statement which is due by the Chancellor, which is due for the 3rd of December. Uh, and we would all, I think we have made a, a very robust uh, and very good case for the devolution of corporation tax powers, and we would expect to get a positive decision in that um, uh, autumn statement. Um, even if we do get a positive statement, it will be a number of years before we will have to uh, implement that. We will be uh, implementing a cut in corporation tax, which means it will be a number of years before it will impact upon public spending in Northern Ireland. What this draft budget does do, though, in, in dealing with both the, the resource pressures that we have and then indeed future pressures, which could include corporation tax, is that it sets us up for reforming and restructuring our public sector in ways which could release savings in years to come, which could be well, it's also being applied against the reductions that we're facing as a result of uh, austerity coming from, from London, uh, could also allow us to pay the cost of corporation tax, which would of course help us to, to transform and rebalance our economy. I call Claire Sugden and the Minister will have about a minute to reply. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement to this House. Um, I note in the Minister's statement that um, Belfast is now number one for global, uh, global, global destination for financial technology investment. Um, how is the Minister mindful in his draft budget of encouraging technology investment on the other side of our country, um, particularly when we have a huge transatlantic cable coming ashore in my constituency? I thank the, the member for, for a question. I think it's something that, even if we don't, I don't represent the Belfast constituency, but I think we could all welcome the fact that Belfast is doing so well in attracting in uh, IT investment from around the world. Belfast is now home to uh, firms like Chicago Mercantile Exchange, Concentrics, and big global brands that you know, 10 years ago we would never thought would likely ever invest in somewhere like Belfast or Northern Ireland. There are, of course, some, um, particularly in the IT sector, investments up in the Northwest. Um, I mentioned to Mr. Ramsey in response to his. Uh, doom and gloom pr uh, prognosis for, for Londonderry earlier about Fujitsu and Seagate's investment in that part of the world. Um, the, um, the member will know, and the member and I have Mr. spoken Mr. before Mr. about the enterprise zone that has uh, been developed in the coal rain area and the, project, the potential of Project Kelvin creates for coal rain in the wider northwest region as well. And that concludes the question to the Minister on a statement.